Well, ever since the conflict with Israel, the war, the declaration of war, there's been a lot of folks that are wondering what's going on. What, what meaneth this? You know, is this the end? Is this the beginning of the end? What, what's going on? And it's really interesting that that's the same dynamic that we get in the Gospel of Mark. Remember last week, it was the poor widow who put in the two very, very small coins into the treasury that Jesus took time to highlight and to express that she had given more than everyone had given. Count it all. Because she gave out of her poverty. Everything that she had to live on, she put in. It's believed that she had lived through most of the day, and at the end of the day, she took whatever was left and put it in the treasury, believing that her Father in heaven would provide the next day. So she was a woman of great faith. And so that's the last public incident recorded in the Gospel of Mark. In that backdrop, we find that in today's reading that they're leaving the temple. And we'll begin at verse 1 of Mark chapter 13. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. <clears throat> You'll be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Father, we ask for ears to hear what the Spirit's saying to the church today in Jesus' name. So here Jesus is leaving the temple. As he's exiting the temple, they're, they're caught up. The disciples are caught up in, in just the, the spectacular buildings that they, that they see. Some of these stones are just massive. And, and as they look at the beauty, they say on the one wall, all the, the gold plates, uh, just, it was a sight, uh, the seventh wonder of the world, you know, it was just all inspiring. Have you ever had any, any kind of experience when you saw something and it was just so amazingly beautiful and majestic and magnificent that you just taken by it? I don't think I've really seen a building that looks like that, but I have seen God's creation. Mm-hmm, yeah, right, yeah. And then he says, just look at the trees, the beauty. Uh, for the last three Mondays, Deb and I have driven down to Brown County State Park and just went through the trees. Since she has no mobility and can't really walk a whole lot, um, we just drive around and look at the beauty. It's magnificent. And then I'm taken by the beauty and the spectacular of, of the Grand Canyon. You know, the first time I saw the Grand Canyon, I just thought, is this real? 
is this real? And uh, when, when you get into the mountains, uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, driving through there and seeing the elk and seeing the snow caps, it's just like, wow. So there's, there's all sorts of things that really impress us. And that's the state of the disciples at this moment. They're seeing something that has just wooed and wowed them beyond their imagination. Now, they're all supposed to pilgrimage like once a year to Jerusalem. So I'm kind of scratching my head. Why was it so spectacular? I'm not sure. But here they are. They're, they're there. They see it. And they draw uh, Jesus' attention to it. And they comment about it. And then Jesus replies. He doesn't quite share the same point of view that they have. He says, do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left upon another. Every one will be thrown down. Wow. Way to put a wet blanket on an awesome moment. Yeah. Earlier we saw that on Palm Sunday, as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, he goes to the temple. It's too late in the day. They go back out. They come back in the next day and he judges the temple. The disciples are just amazed with the beauty and the engineering and everything that's behind it. And they're just, they're astounded. But Jesus says, see, perceive. He's just judged the exchanging of money and sacrifices in the temple. He's just brought in a new revelation of giving in the temple. And, and now what he has implied, he is making very explicit. This place is rubble. This place will be completely destroyed. Obviously, this is fulfilled in 70 AD when, when Rome comes in and they just devastate the temple completely. The abomination of desolation happens at least two times in the history of the temple. Once in the Old Testament and once coming in 70 AD. And so we, we see these kind of things that are talking. Now Jesus is, is just setting the record straight. And then he goes to the Mount of Olives across from the temple. So as he's looking at the temple from the vantage point of the Mount of Olives, here comes Peter, James, and John and Andrew. Hmm, isn't it interesting how Mark likes to get all the details right? And so here comes Andrew. The, the inner three, Peter, James, and John, they go into Jairus' daughter's healing. They go into special places. They're invited to go a little further at, at, the, at the Garden of Gethsemane, all those kind of places. But here, Andrew is included. Don't know what the significance of that is, except that we got four people. I think Andrew might be a little nosy. He wants to get the inside scoop. He's the one that he got the revelation that the Messiah, Jesus was the Messiah, and he had to go tell Peter, had to go, go find Simon and tell his brother, yeah, we found the Messiah. And so here they are, <clears throat> and they're asking him for the inside scoop of when all this is going to happen. What's, what's, what? Tell us. Motivation, one, so we don't get caught unaware. One, so that we know that, you know, when it's happened, we're going to get out of Dodge. We're, we're going to get out of here quick as possible. <clears throat> they still haven't received the Holy Spirit. Jesus hasn't been crucified and resurrected. And so they're still operating in the last week in the life of Jesus. So there they are. Tell us, when will, when will these things happen? What will be the sign that they're about to be fulfilled? See, they have connected with the destruction of the temple with the destruction of the whole world. It's the end. And so if our temple is destroyed, then obviously everything will be destroyed. Mm-hmm. They had a, a, a unique relationship with God. 
that in, even in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant, they would take, and whenever they felt like, man, we're, we're going up a, a, against a, a foe that we can't beat, let's take our good luck charm. Let's take the Ark of the Covenant, and we'll take the Ark of the Covenant in, and we'll, we'll win. And we know how that turned out. Nope. The Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and they didn't have the Ark. And now it's that same kind of Jewish mentality the Hebrews are thinking because God is for them, you know, they'll win. So if God is not for them and the temple is devastated, then the whole world will die. So when we're looking at this chapter 13, Jesus is drawing upon what we call a genre of literature, biblical literature known as apocalyptic lit, apocalyptic literature. And it's very, very normal if you were raised as a Jew, you were raised as a Hebrew, you've been aware of it your whole life but we haven't as Westerners. So oftentimes as Westerners, we come into a passage that's got this kind of symbolism and uh, we don't know exactly what to do with it. How do we understand? For them, they're thinking the end is the end of them, but they're projecting it on the end of the world. And so you kind of get, get off balance. You know, is Jesus talking about the end that's coming in 70 AD? Or is he talking about an eschatological event that's coming in the future where it's over? And those things get mixed in. Because the language that, that the Jewish people used to describe the very end is some of the language that Jesus uses here in chapter 13. When it's your individual end, it doesn't mean it's the end of everybody else's. And that's something that we, we need to understand. We need to understand, okay, we find, uh, you know, as, as a student of the scriptures, I found that whenever someone is getting close to the end of their lifespan here on planet Earth, they almost always gravitate to the eschatological end. They always think that this must be the end times and this is going to be the final climactic event and, and we think we're, we're in it and we're dying and everybody's going to be, you know. If you study Paul, he kind of focuses more on end time stuff the older he gets in, in writing his epistles. And... Uh, it's, it seems to be something that a lot of us do. It's just kind of human. When we get to the end, we, we realize that things are, are coming to a close. We see the world differently than we did when we were 20 and 30 and 40. 